Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, this um, book is being written to the church in Philippi. You may recall Paul is in prison. He's uh, faced more than a little bit of suffering uh, and uh, even faced shipwreck and other problems as he went there. Uh, he's uh, And the people in Philippi recall well how he came to Philippi, and um, he and Silas wound up being unjustly beaten, unjustly tossed into prison, and then how they sang hymns in the middle of the night in a, in a really pretty rotten jail cell. Uh, and the walls came down and the jailer was ready to commit suicide because he knew he would face a horrible death at the hand of the Romans for letting all of these prisoners escape. You may recall how the prisoners did not escape. They stayed and that uh, ultimately, in fact, very quickly, the the jailer and his entire family uh, became followers of Christ. Well, some of the people who are reading this letter are uh, in the jailer's family, the jailer himself, undoubtedly. There was a problem in the church. Paul loved this church and made a point of mentioning how much he loved this church. Um, some would say it was his favorite uh, church. Dealing with a problem that could destroy the church, and it was, at the very least, it was two women who were arguing about something. We have no idea what it was, Euodia and Syntyche. And so there was disharmony beginning in the church, and he was attempting to nip it in the bud. That would clearly imply, and he does much more than that here, that unity is key, and the avoidance of division is, is critical in a Christian community. And he talks about um, a little bit of the possible reasons. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Uh, he doesn't say, well, one of you is doing it this way and another one uh, is doing things that way. But at the root um, is um, you're promoting yourselves. And he just encourages them to humility. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And then he holds up Jesus as the model for doing that. Now, if we go back to uh, John 17, you may recall that is where Jesus has what really is the Lord's Prayer. This is his prayer in the garden shortly before he is arrested. And he says this right in the midst of his prayer, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. So he's not just praying for the apostles and the disciples of that day. He is praying also for all of us. And his prayer for us is that all of them may be one. And he goes even further, and he says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So he basically is ascribing this oneness even to the level of the Trinity. And then he says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Okay, now recall what he says, as recorded in Mark, they will know that you are Christians by your love. Well, obviously, love keeps no records of wrong, love forgives, um, there is total harmony in love, there is no disunity in true love. And he's saying that becomes the evidence that the world can look at to be attracted to me, to Jesus, 
Obviously, that has not been the history of the church age. Um, well, there certainly have been the most incredible um, manifestations of love and groups where that is absolutely the case for a period of time. Uh, over and over and over again, division enters. Quite often it comes from an individual or a couple of individuals um, seeking something other than um, the glory of God seeking glory for themselves. He says here, I have given them glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. In other words, the glory um, that we are given. Now, in this world, it's not glory of light. Rather, it has to do with respect and honor um, as being children of God. Um, he says, I've given you the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. So the purpose then, again, is this unity. And the unity is one of love. Think about marriage. The man and the woman become one flesh. They become one. And uh, the, the, uh, Paul writes and speaks about the necessity for the man and woman to love one another. Uh, he speaks of it as, and he says, no man yet hateth his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Likewise, that is what he's supposed to be doing for his wife. And similarly for the wife, wives are to love their husbands. Husbands are to love their wives, even as Christ loved the church. You see this emphasis then on oneness, that at the very critical point, that juncture, where Jesus is about to perform the sacrifice that ultimately will uh, redeem uh, those who are lost. It is at that point that he identifies exactly what is most critical. And, you know, when somebody is about to die, the things that come from their lips take on a special importance because there will be no more talk. Now, in the case of Jesus, obviously, he exists after death. He is raised to life. Uh, but nonetheless, these words are very important, and the emphasis is, uh, is, is very key. So now let's go uh, back over to Philippians. The emphasis again here is from Paul, be one. And uh, he says, make my joy complete. And remember, this is an epistle about joy. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Why? because you are united with Christ. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. He's going to hold up Jesus as the example of humility. So rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Well, the poster child for selfish ambition or vain conceit is Satan. James Boyce wrote this, had very interesting commentary on Philippians. If you've not ever read it, I would encourage you to do that. To care for another person is at the heart of a right relationship with God. All rebellion against God is inevitably linked to a corresponding disregard for others. Okay, and so when you get to uh, Satan, his regard is for himself, and that is his goal. So if we take a look at Ezekiel uh, 28, and we'll look first at, uh, at verse 1, and this whole section from 1 to 10 is dealing with an earthly ruler. God speaks to Ezekiel, and he says, look, he calls him son of man, say this to the ruler of Tyre, and it's actually the prince of Tyre, and the word here for ruler is Nagid, which is more probably better translated as um, the commander or the prince. So in other words, this is not the ultimate ruler. This is not the highest authority. This is somebody who is under authority, that particular word in Hebrew, nagid. And this is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. Well, there certainly have been many emperors, Caesars, kings, and the rest uh, who have said that uh, they were gods. Uh, you know, the emperor in Japan uh, was worshipped as a god. You go back to Egypt. Uh, the pharaohs were worshipped as gods, and so on. And likewise, uh, this man who is the king of Tyre, but he is um, here identified as the commander uh, of, of Prince of Tyre. But you are a mere mortal and not a god. 
though you think you are as wise as God. Are you wiser than Daniel? Is no secret hidden from you? By your wisdom and understanding, you have gained wealth for yourself and amassed gold and silver in your treasures. Emphasis here is you have focused on yourself uh, to accumulate. Um, by your great skill in trading, you have increased your wealth, and because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you think you're wise, as wise as a god, I'm going to bring foreigners against you, the most ruthless of nations. They will draw their swords against your beauty and wisdom and pierce your shining splendor. They will bring you down to the pit, and you will die a violent death in the heart of the seas. Will you then say, I am a god? In the presence of those who kill you, you will be but a mortal, not a god, in the hands of those who slay you. You will die the death of the uncircumcised at the hands of foreigners. I have spoken, declares the Lord. Okay, so he's speaking to this prince of Tyre, uh, the man who was at that point the earthly king of Tyre. Now he talks to the one who is behind the king. And by the way, the king of Tyre was destroyed in exactly that way. And now the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel, and he says, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now notice it says king. The word here is melech, which means ruler, um, ultimate king, ultimate authority, the one who is in charge. Okay, and so in Ephesians 6, Paul writes about uh, our battle being with powers and principalities, not with earthly kings. And that is what is being identified here, that behind the king of Tyre, um, the one who stands behind him is Satan. And now you get a description of Satan, and it's clear this is not an earthly king. Um, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. Now, you can see presented here that this is a perfect and um, most beautiful uh, creation of God. It says, you are the seal of, uh, of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. If you look at the names of Satan, Lucifer, light bearer, Satan, of course, means adversary. It's really just a title. Uh, the word for serpent back in Genesis means the shining, shimmering one. It actually was a, a word of beauty. It's not that today, of course, it's certainly not in English. Um, but you see how he was adorned. So he has everything somebody would want, uh, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. And then beyond that, it says, you were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. The word for anointed here is Mashiach. Okay, so he was anointed. Now, in the Old Testament, you had three offices anointed, prophet, priest, and king priest and king, most obviously. Satan was a prophet of God. You find that out a little bit further. He was also a priest. He was um, an intermediary between God and other angels, between God ultimately and to some degree and man, even found in the garden, they're speaking, perhaps put there in order to speak as God. Um, or on God's behalf. The word for prophet uh, in the Hebrew means mouthpiece. So Aaron was appointed as Moses' prophet. Moses said, hey, I don't really speak very well, Lord. And um, uh, God said, okay, um, we'll speak to the people through Aaron, your brother. Satan then speaks as a prophet of God on God's behalf. Um, he is anointed as a guardian cherub. Who are the guardian cherubs? Well, you find out about the guardian cherubs right in the very beginning of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1. Okay, as Ezekiel is there by the river Kibar, he looks, he sees this windstorm coming out of the north. He sees an immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. 
The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. In the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces, four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Well, as you go farther down, you come to discover that um, these are the guardian cherubim, and there are four of them. Now, it's interesting. Of course, this has happened after, um, after Satan has fallen. The fifth guardian cherub would have been Lucifer, but he apparently was the ultimate in God's creation, perfect in beauty. By the way, one of the symbols for uh, the devil uh, is a pentagram, which would be what you would see if you were above uh, looking down at these five angels. They're not guarding God from people. They are guarding people from God, guarding other creatures from God. This is, in essence, God's inner circle at that time. Uh, he says, look, you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your days from the day, oh, look, you were created. He was created. He was a created being, just as all the angels were. And it says, you were blameless until wickedness was found in you. So he was created sinless. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. Now, the word for trade doesn't just mean trading of merchandise and goods. It also has to do with carrying communications and representing someone else. And so here is this being who is beautiful, the most beautiful of God's creation, uh, and he winds up being corrupted as he represents God throughout, I'll say the universe, but um, I believe this is beyond the universe throughout all of the areas of everything in which um, God acts, which is everything that, that is or could be or will be. And so he sinned. And it says, so I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the firing stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. So notice the word proud here, okay? Because when you contrast that to Jesus, you won't see proud, you'll see humble. And this is on account of his beauty. In Isaiah 53, we read that when it comes to the Messiah, the true Messiah, there is no beauty that would attract us to him. We're told that there is nothing. And somebody would look at him and say, oh, I want to follow that guy. This guy is outstanding. You know, I mean, you see some of the same where um, they selected the king um, you know, where, where the Israelites, uh, for their first king, they wanted Saul. Saul looked like a king, big, tall, strong, muscular. Um, David was a shepherd boy, and he was a lot smaller. And yet, he was the king God wanted. Um, he was humble. He had a heart after God's own heart. So Satan's heart became proud on account of his beauty, and he corrupted his wisdom because of his splendor. Okay, so that's an interesting thing. He thought differently because at the root, he thought first of himself and his own beauty. And he said in his heart, obviously, I am better than God, which we read in Isaiah. God uh, says about Satan, so I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made fire come out from you, and it consumed you. Now, this is perspective. God handles time in a different way. This is yet to come. I reduce you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who are watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Now, if we go over to Isaiah 12 through 14, God speaking here about Satan, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. Now, morning star is also ascribed as a name to Jesus. You have been cast down to the earth, 
you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So it's interesting. The name that he uses, that he says he wants of God's names, um, there are so many other names he could have selected that were wonderful names, good names, um, a God who provides. Um, he could have selected just I am, the God who is, and somebody selects the Most High. Why select the Most High? Well, I think you find out why back in Genesis 14, which is where Melchizedek, over in verse 18, blesses Abram. And he blessed Abram, and he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, El Elyon, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And actually, the word here, creator, it's an interesting word because it actually, most translations have possessor of heaven and earth. Possessor, because he created it, certainly, but possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, Satan wanted to possess what God had. And ultimately, he had some success. He is today the ruler of the earth, the ruler of this world. And now you see this, it's, it's an interesting flow where he starts with nothing. He is trying to get everything, and then he comes back down and uh, uh, is ultimately destroyed. Uh, a parabola, if you will. Um, what we see when we go over to uh, Philippians is that the passage of Scripture in Philippians 2 shows us Jesus likewise in this parabolic trajectory, but the parabola is not from low to high back to even lower. It is from high to extraordinarily low and then exalted to the highest of high. Okay, so Paul writes, and he says, look, um, you folks in Philippi, and also this is addressed to us and to all other Christians, in your relationship with one another, think the same way that Jesus did. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Um, in humility, he says just before this, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We have a tendency to look really to love ourselves first. In fact, it is part of our nature. I don't know if you remember the old BVD ad, next to myself, I like BVDs best. Okay, now that has within it a double meaning. Okay, certainly physically, your underwear is going to be right next to you. But beyond that, um, I love myself. And next to my love for myself, I like my BVDs. It's a strange concept, but it's advertising. Okay, we love ourselves. And we're called to love our neighbor as we already love ourselves. And then Jesus says, a new command I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, where he put us above himself and sacrificed himself for us. Greater love than this hath no man, that he sacrificed himself for his friends. In your relationships with one another, he's saying here, Paul's writing, guided by the Holy Spirit, have the same mindset, take the same approach to others. And then he says, look, I'm going to tell you how far Jesus stooped in order to put others above himself. Okay, there was nobody above him. It says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now, when it talks about being in very nature, some will say in the form of God, older translations, and it's the idea of more than just physical appearance. It's the entire substance and essence is God. And it says, did not consider equality with God. Well, the word here for equality is the Greek word isos. So you're familiar perhaps with an isosceles triangle. That means a triangle where all three legs are exactly the same length. They're all equal. And 
this equality here is absolutely equal in every single way. And he didn't consider that to be something to hold on to, to be used for his own advantage. Okay, now contrast that with Satan. So you have this anointed one, not God, created. Jesus had no beginning. He was God throughout all eternity past. In the Old Testament, you see just a few glimpses of Jesus. He's referred to as the Son in Psalm 2. In Isaiah 48, you can see uh, him appear there where the Trinity is described. You know, and you see various other glimpses of him appearing as the angel of God or the commander of the Lord's host. Um, But he is God. That's where he starts, equal with God just as God as God is. In Hebrews, God the Father calls God the Son God in Hebrews chapter 1. God the Son calls Jesus God, my God, in uh, Hebrews chapter 1. That's where he starts. He's God. He's got everything. He possesses it as the creator. He he possesses it through his power. He possesses it through who he is. Um, He has the capacity to destroy it in an instant. Um, He has the capacity to do anything he wants. But unlike Satan, who had selfish ambition, Jesus is humble, thinks of others. Okay, and this is a shocker. God thinks of others as better than himself. Let that sink in for a moment. Okay, Uh, you know, there are so many times in life where we or tempted to look at someone else, and perhaps we have, and say, well, thankfully I'm not him or I'm not her. You know, and, and there's a tendency to think of ourselves as better because that's how we're made. But that is not in the image of God. And so Jesus, it says, didn't hold on to being God, didn't hold on to the perks of being God, the appearance of being God actually the glory, the manifestation before others of God. Rather, it says, he made himself nothing. Okay, and uh, nothing meant coming here, taking on the very form, substance, essence, uh, appearance, in this case, of a servant being made in human likeness. So God becoming nothing means becoming a human being. The distance between us and an ant is probably nowhere near as great as the distance between God and us. You know, I walk past the ants, but they're scrambling around on the ground. I don't pay any attention to them. If I accidentally step on one, I step on one. It's not something that I think about. If one crawls on my leg, I just shoo it off. It's just a bother. Um, God, The God of the universe who created us cherishes us and actually thinks of us as being something to honor, uh, something to care about, something to die for. And so he's made in human likeness, and he now you can see this parabola in reverse. He starts up high, and he comes down and becomes a nothing. And being found in appearance as a man, so he appeared as one of us because he was, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, we're told in Scripture that the angels desire to look into so many things. They'd like to find out more about God's plans going forward. And undoubtedly, they were themselves, I suspect, quite surprised when Jesus became a human being. I mean, mind-boggling for him to become lower than the angels, okay? And it says in Hebrews 2 that we have been made lower than the angels for a time, that he was made lower than the angels for a time, okay? And so, because of his obedience, and it says he humbled himself. Again, contrast this to Satan, who wanted everything for himself, um, nothing for God, certainly, nothing for anyone else, but he wanted complete control. And here is God himself, the character of God, and he humbles himself, and he becomes obedient. Okay, how does the king become obedient, the ultimate king? 
Okay. It, it, it really boggles the mind to consider this. He becomes obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Satan sought to possess heaven and earth. He started with nothing. He, supposed, he sought to possess everything for himself, the ultimate manifestation of selfishness. Jesus starts with everything and actively seeks to possess nothing. And then ultimately, he winds up because he gave it up for others, because he was obedient, even to the point of death, even death on a cross, that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, death on a cross, and you know, um, we've talked about it before. Some of you have heard me share with regards to the actual physical suffering. But there's an aspect of it that is very important to know, because I think this is the ultimate challenge on the cross. I mean, there were so many. I mean, it was just a horrible, horrible form of torture. Have you ever been in a situation where you couldn't catch your breath? And uh, you're struggling to breathe. Um, you know, somebody with severe COPD may feel that way. You may have played football and you got the, the wind knocked out of you, you know, or it might even just be in the middle of the night, you wake up and you just can't breathe. Even worse than that, you're drowning. You know, perhaps you've had that experience. You cannot breathe. Imagine that going on over an extended period of time, hour after hour after hour. You cannot breathe, and you're going in and out of consciousness, and you wake up and you can't breathe because the paralyzing of the diaphragm is one of the results of this particular kind of crucifixion, this particular kind of torture. Jesus knew in advance exactly what he was going to be going through. Um, and, uh, you know, in the garden, he was in agony. He knew in advance he would somehow be separated from God the Father, with whom he was. Um, coupled from, uh, from eternity past, but he was going to experience the pain of hell, separation from God, and yet he willingly embraced the cross for our sake. Have this mindset in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. It's hard for us to imagine how much he gave up. Um, so, But then the next thing is, although he made the choice to go down, he is lifted up by God. Satan made the choice to go up, or at least attempt to, and he is pushed down and judged by God. So it says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And there certainly is a day coming when that will happen. Now, for many, it will be a day of rejoicing. For others, it will be a day of consternation, a day of a, a great problem, um, that, uh, a, a shocking day. Uh, and every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Um, the, um, so the whole point out of all of this is, as a believer— it is our responsibility to care for others, that that is at the heart of a right relationship with God. It is also at the heart of true religion. Religion is never spoken of positively by Jesus, you know, just the earthly practice of various rituals. Um, but here, True religion is described. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. Their religion is worthless. Uh, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The word for look after is uh, episcopal, like episcopal, and it means to care for. And so the purpose of religion, if you want to have Religion in your life, true religion, is care for others. In uh, Romans chapter 12, we read that after all has been cared for, our sin has forgiven us, as Paul writes to the Romans. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through 
Christ Jesus. And then you get to Romans 8, 1, and it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So if there is no condemnation, then there is no basis to offer a sacrifice in a temple. There is no basis to do what the Jews have been doing and what the Greeks have been doing, what the Romans have been doing, where they offered sacrifices in various temples to various gods. The Jews, of course, to the true God. But nonetheless, no more sacrifice for sin is necessary. So what do you do? What is the religion, then, of a Christian? Christians were referred to as atheists uh, by Jews and Greeks uh, and Romans because they didn't offer any sacrifice to anyone. And what Paul writes is, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in other words, he has forgiven us through the sacrifice performed by Jesus. He did the sacrifice for us. In view of his mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. It's also referred to as your spiritual worship, depending on the translation. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the point here is um, we are called to offer ourselves as a sacrifice. How do you do that? Well, you're sacrificing yourself for the sake of others. A mother sacrifices herself for her child, getting up in the middle of the night. A father sacrifices himself for the child um, as well, you know, and it's because they love their children. And in some cases, parents will even sacrifice themselves uh, physically, give their lives to save their children. Uh, you see it in so many different ways where people offer this sacrifice, but that's a sacrifice where somebody dies. A living sacrifice is something where you're doing it day after day after day after day. In some ways, that's more challenging. Uh, you know, it's been said that the problem with living sacrifices is they have a tendency to crawl off the altar, and that's the way we are. We tend to go back to thinking about ourselves. It's an easy thing to do, certainly. He did that to me, and you want me to do this? You want me to forgive him? You can't imagine what he did to me. You couldn't forgive him. Why should I forgive him? Uh, and so on. And it may go on and on and on. You don't know what he did to me. Um, you know, you can think through the different options. But you know what they did to Jesus. And his first words were, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Okay, let's go back to Philippians now. What we have now is this situation that, Jesus is now exalted to the highest place. Not everybody knows that yet. He has the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Now, that part hasn't happened yet. There are those who recognize him today and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, but there are a great many who do not. But ultimately, Every tongue will know and will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We've been dealing a lot with the deity of Jesus. He also was 100% man. He was not a man before the incarnation. Incarnation literally means he put a body on. He was born into a human body. But he has always been God. And God took on a new nature, a second nature. Jesus did in the form of a man.